good to see a large turnout for this, and sorry to see um, a number of uh, people exceeds the number of seats. But, uh, here we are. Right, so, um, yes, yeah, so I have uh, been doing RSGB EMC committee works since for 30, 30 years or so, and um, uh, including, well, writing the EMC column in Radcom in recent years, about the last, was it 25? And uh, <laughs> certainly at least 20. And, and, but also making, measure, making laboratory measurements and uh, doing some field measurements on that, as you will see. Okay, so this is about recent developments in electronic equipment. And many of these are related to um, improving environmental aspects and reducing CO2 emissions, which may require some electronics. And um, what we need to keep an eye on is that the um, reduction in CO2 emissions doesn't come at the price of polluting the electromagnetic environment. And if these things are well engineered, then it shouldn't cause a problem. But as you will see, not all of them are. So these are the things we're going to look at. Um, electric vehicle charging, briefly, 12 volt battery chargers, which uh, deserve a mention. LED lighting, which is the only sort of lighting we can have nowadays. Wind turbines, VDSL, um, air source heat pumps, and especially solar photovoltaic systems. So we'll start with electric vehicle charging and wireless power transfer. Electric cars or buses could use this. Um, there's not a great deal of it uh, in use, as far as I can see. Um, uh, much is still being debated in standards bodies, and the IARU um, EMC people are very active in that, as in many other fields. So they're switching at about 85 kilohertz, so you say, well, that's well below all the amateur bands, which would, of course, be fine if it wasn't for the odd matter of harmonics. And, of course, you generate a square wave for efficiency, and the harmonics go up and up. But you can't... They don't run on a fixed frequency because the... It needs to be resonant, and they need to run at the frequency at which the loop under the car resonates. And instead of tuning the antenna, they tune the transmitter. So it's a bit like, you know, if, if, if you, you had an antenna that was stuck on one frequency and very narrow bandwidth, so you change your transmitter frequency to m match your antenna. Well, that's what effectively what they're doing, which means that the harmonics can go anywhere um, once you get up to the high ones. So lots of work going on there. And um, again, on behalf of... IARU EMC standards people, including the global IARU EMC coordinator, who I can see standing over there. Um, it could be widely deployed. You know, there are scenarios where you're never more than sort of 10, 20 meters from a wireless power transfer charger. There are various reasons why it might not be particularly widely de deployed. One is efficiency, like if you're going to lose 8% of your power in the wireless transfer. This, this has some significant um, 
disadvantages in, in terms of CO2 emissions. Another thing is the size and weight of fitting these big coils under the vehicle. And, you know, you, you, you can get like 3 kilowatt, 5 kilowatt ones. If you want to get 22 kilowatt fast chargers, then wireless power transfer is not really for you. And another thing about it is it's only unidirectional. You can charge the car. You can't discharge the car. So why might you want to discharge the car? Well, um, there are pro proposals whereby when you're charging your electric vehicle, at times the grid can take some of the power back so that there's a, a reservoir. But anyway, the, the, there are, um, it remains to be seen how widespread it becomes. But it's... Um, definitely on our radar. Other radio users, broadcasting will be effect, could be affected, well, would be affected for sure. And um, another thing that is, is significant for wireless power transfer is that there are smart metering applications using power line communications below 150 kilohertz. Now, we know that power line communications um, is considered by radio amateurs to be you know, one of the worst things that ever happened. However, if it's below 150 kilohertz, it doesn't really cause us too much of a problem. Maybe 137 kilohertz, I hear you say. Um, but anyway, the um, electricity supply people want to be able to use that for for metering, and they don't want massive great signals from wireless power transfer um, coming up. So, so there's potentially some allies in, uh, as other than radio users. Um, wired vehicle charging. Well, electric cars, so we haven't seen many problems with electric vehicle chargers, wired electric vehicle chargers, fixed installations. Um, I mean fixed installations in not the, the, that that has a special meaning in EMC, and I don't mean <laughs> the special meaning of fixed installations. I just mean you know if if something's wired into your house wiring, and um, it's got to meet quite strict safety standards, and it tends to meet the EMC standards as well. So we don't see much evidence of non-compliance equipment. Um, electric bicycles and scooters are another matter because these might have small built-in spill, small um, in-line charges, you know, like the ones you have with a laptop, that's sometimes called a dog on a lead. And um, as with laptop chargers, not all of them are particularly well filtered for RFI. And, of course, it's not just... RFI onto the mains, you can test a switching power supply um, and make it pass on RF emissions into the mains if you've only got, uh, say, a short wire connected to the output with not much capacitance to ground. Well, an electric bicycle does have a significant capacitance to ground, and therefore you'll get some common mode current in the DC output lead. So... Um, you know, it might it makes a difference whether you're charging a mobile phone, a laptop, or an electric bicycle. Anyway, so that's a little bit on electric vehicles. So another thing that uh, is a star of the show at the moment in uh, in terms of calls to the uh, EMC help desk. Well, actually, it's it's been overtaken by solar PV, but we have quite seen quite a lot of these. And um, so these are just ordinary 12-volt car battery chargers that you'd use for a car, motorbike, um, ride on lawnmower or something, something like that. And uh, not, this is not for electric vehicle chargers. And if you look at that photo, where is the RF interference filtering? This is the mains input. Um, this is the, there's a rectifier underneath, this is the main switching transistor and the transformer. The, that's where the RF interference filtering isn't. 
And it's not only not there, it's not even spaces on the printed circuit board for it. You know, we, have, we do see power supplies where there are spaces on the board and the components are not fitted. Um, but no, we don't even have spaces on the board. So these are well, um, widely available online, uh, from, especially from a company that has the same name as a major South American river. And, well, there's been an article in Radcom with somebody who went DFing one of these and uh, found it was, you know, hundreds of metres away and, and, and causing absolute havoc, on, certainly on HF and, and I think pretty bad on 50 meg as well. So, here is what happened when we tested one. So this is, the, um, this is the test setup, so conducted emission, so we're testing what comes out of the mains, comes out of the charger, into the mains rather, and uh, we've got a, a car battery there, and an isolating turtle. This is a listener line impedance stabiliser network, it's a, it's a homebrew one, and a uh, spectrum analyzer, and this is what we find. So the limit is... This, this is what it should be below, and this is what we actually get. So it's up to 30 dB above, and that means a thousand times more in power ratio. So you could have a thousand compliant battery chargers, which give you less RFI than one non-compliant. Great, eh? All is not lost, however. Um, we do have, I have found somebody selling now some add-in, some inline mains RFI filters that um, could be used. Um, they used to be around, for, but they were quite expensive. These ones are not cheap, they're sort of around the £20 mark. So the next going thing we're going to do is um, evaluate those and try testing this again with the plug-in filter and see what happens. Okay, um, LED lighting. Well, as I said, all lighting is or will be LED lighting in due course because um, compact fluorescents have gone out. These sort of fluorescents have gone and will be replaced. They'll either replace the tubes with LED tubes. In fact, they might have even got them. Yes, if you look up here, you can see that the tubes have got a line of little dots. So those, these have already been done with the LED um, tubes, so to speak. But um, the, 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 the main thing we've come across is 12 volt. This is an example of a, a kitchen with 14 12 volt. Originally they were 50 watt halogen. So that was 700 watts, a pretty serious amount of power for lighting a kitchen. So we replace them with LEDs and you reduce it to 70 watts, which is a substantial improvement. And when the LED lights are off, the DAB radio works perfectly. And then it says um, BBC Radio 2, signal error, well, there's some, some low number there, and signal strength. So it's an adequate signal um, with an adequately low error rate. And then when the LED lights are turned on, it says BBC Radio 2, service not available. So this is the sort of thing that, that can happen, and uh, non-technical users might not understand why that uh, their, their DAB stops working when they turn the LED lights on. And, and if they do, they probably don't know who to complain to. But anyway, um, 
It's mainly an issue with 12 volt lights because um, originally the, the halogen bulbs were considered benign, so from, from the EMC standards point of view, you didn't need to test them because they were just filament lamps. And when you made a 12 volt replacement, then they're definitely not benign. So the standard had to be updated to, to show that um, for LED lighting, to, to incorporate tests for 12 volt ones, and inevitably it takes a long time for it to filter through the system and get um, become a harmonised standard. But that, that one is underway. Um, not sure whether it's yet a harmonised standard, but uh, it will eventually be. That doesn't mean to say that mains operated LED lights uh, don't cause interference because some of them are truly appalling. But that's because they don't comply with the standard. In the case of 12 volt lights, they don't have to comply with any standard on the DC input. So if you've got any 12 volt ones that cause interference, you know, a 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor across the 12 volt supply will probably do the trick. But of course, that would have added at least two pence to the cost, so that's why they didn't fit it. Another thing with, with replacing halogens with 12 volt is that the original electronic transformers would have been designed for 50 watt load, and if you underload them, then they can do strange things. So people tend to tr replace the transformer as well. Um, okay, wind turbines. So it came to our attention that um, some wind turbines were wiping out top band in Yorkshire. How we decided to go and have a look. So the wind turbines then, um, each one's radiated two megawatts output. And the original ones were not causing any RF interference problem. And then somebody came up with the idea of something called a doubly fed induction generator. And what this does, if you, when you have a, a um, conventional wind turbine that's uh, non-electronic, then it has to run synchronously to the mains. So the turbine blades have to work, have to rotate at a particular speed, and. The, depending on the wind speed, that might not give the greatest efficiency. So, somebody came up with the idea of um, feeding the state at the excited. If you know how an alternator, like, it's just like a giant version of a car alternator. So the the, the exciter winding in the the middle, the armature, is um, or the rotor rather, is in a car alternator is fed by DC. And um, the same can apply in a, in a um, wind turbine. So what they came up with was, well, instead of feeding it with DC, we'll feed it with between 0 and 5 hertz AC. And then you can effectively, you can run your... Um, turbine sort of 10% faster or 10% slower than the speed that it would have to run at if it was synchronous to the 50 hertz mains. Anyway, well, as you can imagine, a, a 2 megawatt turbine has a pretty serious amount of current in the rotor and the exciter winding, and if you're going to make that 5 hertz AC using switching techniques, it could um, radiate, and in fact, the, um, the problem is that they're very intense magnetic field sources. And uh, the standards say, well, you know, you don't have to test it below 30 megahertz because it's small compared to a wavelength. Well, of course, these are not small compared to a wavelength. Anyway, again, this is, uh, this is what the sort of thing we were getting on 1.8 meg. And this is, uh, again, much work has been done in standards organisations on this. VDSL, now I'll just say very briefly on the, we could have made a whole subject of this in itself. Um, 
uh, we'll mention it in passing. So at, as it is well known and has much been published in RADCOM, that uh, it uses frequencies up to 17.6 megahertz on existing copper telephony pairs and leaks particularly 10 megahertz um, is particularly badly affected because that's upstream and uh, so there's a strong signal going out from your house on 10 megahertz and a lot either side in fact 8.5 to 12 this downstream 12 to 17.664 isn't only used if you're fairly close to the cabinet so um, probably 90% of VDSL lines don't put anything out on 14 megahertz, but those that do, it's really bad. So um, you can find an EMC advice leaflet, EMC 17, and there is some software that has been custom written by Martin, oh, G8, Kilo Delta Foxtrot, who um, knows all about how to design the chips for VDSL. Anyway, so that um, can be used to identify VDSL noise as without a doubt and measure the level of VDSL noise compared to any other noise. And again, there's a, there's a reporting procedure on that and uh, the only thing I would say is that whilst there's a lot of VDSL noise around still, it should be in due course declining because of um, fibre to the premises. I got a note through my door yesterday about would you like to sign up for fibre to the premises and if 30% of the people in your street do, then you can have it. And, it, um, and you can have 250 megabit per second, which of course is... Nobody needs, but there we are. Um, but I don't. So anyway, air source heat pumps is the next item. So it's effectively a air conditioning unit working backwards. So you cool the air outside, and you bring some heat inside, and you get the heat from the air outside plus the heat from the electricity that you've used, and all that adds up to about three times as much heat as you would have had if you just used the electricity to do the heating. Well, again, these were all right until somebody came up with the idea of a variable speed AC motor drive for the compressor, because they could make it more efficient. So instead of running at 50 hertz, well, let's see if we can run it at 40 hertz or 60 hertz. Now, you're going to need to chop up uh, you know, rectify the uh, mains and chop it up and make a lower or higher frequency AC waveform. And guess what? Um, if you do that, and its rating is a power of several kilowatts, the possibilities for RF interference are significant. So here's one that we found. And um, this is what it was doing. So it was quite bad on... Sorry, it was quite bad on 18 megahertz, but it wasn't at all bad on 14. So this is some probably some sort of resonant effect, and it all is not lost with heat pumps because we've one case was solved by changing to different heat pumps. So it should be possible to find out why the noisy ones are noisy and work with the manufacturers and try and quiet them down. Um, we're not sure if they're radiating directly from the case or whether it's coming out the, con the connecting cables, but if it's directly from the case, then we've got a bit of a problem because the standards don't um, test radiated emissions below 30 megs, or at least the ones for air source heat pumps don't. Photovoltaic. Okay, so this is the star of the show for today. Um, this is a system without optimizers. So what they do is they connect up typically maybe seven panels in series and they go into the inverter. Of course, it would um, have been more efficient if they had each panel had its own inverter. Um, but 
they connect them up in series to get a, um, a voltage. I think they can run up to about 500 volts um, when it's uh, fully illuminated. So if you've got solar panels without optimizers, then the source of RFI could be the cable, the DC cable. Um, the inverter could be a ground level, or it could be in the loft, um, and there could be a battery. And if there is, then it's pretty heavy. So hybrid inverters can have battery storage, and some can supply at five kilowatts AC load, so you can store up, store energy when it's sunny and use it when it's dark. And of course, if you want to supply five kilowatts and you've got a 50 volt battery, you're going to need 100 amps DC. And a 100 amp switching power supply that's gonna transform that up to 240 volts AC is a pretty serious switching power supply, which has potentially some pretty serious EMC issues. Um, depending on whether you have to test the emissions on the DC power ports. Now, this is optimizers with optimizers, and the reason why they have them is because you might have um, a, a, a tree cast a shadow over one of the panels, and then that then goes higher resistance than the others, and that then limits the current in the series chain. So the optimizers are switching DC to DC converters, switching regulators, they're up on the roof, behind the panels usually. Um, and the other thing is the inverter needs to communicate with the channels, the, the optimizer, so there is some sort of communication channel. So guess what? Somebody had the idea of, oh, we can use the DC power lines as power line communications. And, oh, the, the, there's a standard for power line communications, but that only affects the AC lines. So if you're on an AC line, using it on the AC lines, you've got to notch the amateur ba radio bands. If you use it on DC lines, oh, whoopee, there's no, no need to notch the amateur bands. There's no applicable standard for DC lines. They can do what they like. So what they do is they, they communicate at 100 kilohertz. Now, if you or I were communicating at 100 kilohertz, we wouldn't be putting out larger numbers of harmonics up to 50 megahertz and beyond. Um, but the people who designed these things didn't see it that way. They thought, oh, they, they treated it like a local area network, you see, and they're putting out square waves. So we first came across this in 2012. So I went to see a system near Bristol where a radio amateur and his next door neighbor in, a semi in the same semi-detached house had had, both had solar PV put in and both the same systems. They had two inverters, one each, and a total of 26 optimizers. So the VHF noise was particularly bad on 144 to 146 megahertz was pretty bad on other VHF frequencies as well. Um, and you can find that in RADCOM February 2013. Well, a lot has happened since then and in the field of EMC standards, and things are still happening. So this and other cases got fed through into the standards-making process, and it got to the attention of the IARU EMC specialists that something needed to be done. And something was done, um, but it hasn't quite filtered through to the market yet. So this is what we saw. So the red line, this is with the optimizers running, and this is what you see with the same measuring antenna and the same spectrum analyzer at another location which doesn't have solar PV. So we're looking at 20 dB, rising the noise floor 20 dB, and that is not good. <laughs> so what that means is, on two meters, um, 
if you're receiving a, a signal, somebody says, well, whatever, whatever transmitter power um, the distant station is using, they would need to increase that by a factor of 100 uh, to overcome the noise from the, these dreaded optimizers. So the distance, they, this was measured at 10 metres from the nearest optimizer, and the furthest ones were up to 20 metres away. Um, so what are the issues for EMC standards? Well, lots, in fact. The first is separation. The EMC standards um, assume that there is one item and it's 10 metres from the receiving antenna. So where do solar panels go on the roof? Where do antennas go up at the roof level? So can you get 10 metre separation? Well, not very easily. Um, can you put your antenna 10 metres higher than it is at the moment? I think your local council planning might have something to say about that. So. One thing, then, is that the, um, the distance of 10 metres is not always achieved in practice. Another thing is um, the number of devices. So although that system isn't actually got optimizers, um, the systems that do will typically, a typical number of panels would be 14, and 14 optimizers produce more RF interference than one. Just how much more they produce and how you allow for it in the standards when they're at different distances from the receiving antenna is a very interesting question. And Martin has a very interesting answer to it, has a frightfully uh, clever Monte Carlo modelling um, that has, uh, takes account of multiple devices. But anyway, so, um, so really, optimizers bring, raise three issues, not only the separation, um, because they tend to be up near where antennas are, not only the number of devices, but also the fact that the generic EMC standards didn't have any limits for DC power ports. So you could do what you like. Well, maybe you could do what you like, except, of course, you still had to meet the protection requirements of the EMC regulations. And anyway... Um, that has changed, well, almost, because thanks to the work of IARU, um, Thilo Coots, Delta Lima 9 Kilo Charlie Echo, who was the IARU EMC coordinator, and others, they did a lot of work to get a product standard introduced. So you used to be able to, the, the situation used to be, if there's no product standard, then you meet the generic standard. And the generic standard was um, published as a harmonised standard, and the generic standard didn't have any DC limits on the conducted emissions below 30 megahertz on the DC power ports. However, that changed in 2015, CISPA 11, so CISPA is the International Special Committee on Radio Interference, and CISPA 11 introduced DC power port limits and also became the, um, a product standard. Meanwhile, um, while that was filtering through the system, there's something called EMC ADCO, which is a European... Um, working group of tri trading standards departments and equivalent, and they looked at, they do cross-border market surveillance campaigns. I don't think they cross the UK border, but anyway, they do um, in continental Europe, and you can find their publications, and they do a different thing each year. So when they did, in 2019, they did solar panel inverters, and they said, compliance with the disturbance emission limits was even worse than 2014 campaign 
with 25% of equipment under test complying against 33% in 2014. Uh, at that time, in 2019, the harmonised standard was the generic standard. So the standard they didn't comply with, with was the generic standard, and they didn't have to comply with the DC power port limits. However, on the 4th of November 2020, in the official journal of the European Union, it published a list of harmonised standards, or standards that be then become harmonised by reason of being published. And this included EN 55011. So this is the CISPA 11 becomes, is incorporated into EN 55011. And um, it's industrial, scientific and medical equipment. And it is specifically a product standard. And there's a 2017 version, a 2020 version, a 2021 version. And the important thing is Table 5. Um, group 1 equipment is what covers solar PV. Um, class B is the tighter emission limits for domestic and light industrial. There's also Class A, which is the higher limits that wouldn't be applicable in residential areas. So they've got limits from 0.15 to 30 megahertz. And a section says, the limits for the LV, low voltage DC power port, only apply to grid connected power converters, GCPCs, intended for assembly into photovoltaic power generating systems. So there it is, it is a product standard. So what has happened? It's been a product standard since 2020, 4th of November in fact. And um, once there is a product standard, then the generic standard is no longer provides presumption of conformity with the essential requirements of the EMC directive. There were some um, dates of, you know, things were deferred for um, older standards remained in force until uh, I think the last date was the 4th of May 22. After that date, it would appear that everybody who is selling inverters would have to comply with EN 55011 of 2020 amendment. There is a complication, which is that if your inverter has Wi-Fi in it, as many do, then it is covered by the Radio Equipment Directive. And, um, well, it's a rather complicated situation, but now you may say, mm, what happened on the 31st of December 2020? UK left the EU. Does that mean that they don't the standards don't apply. And no, I think it means it makes no difference at all. And you can find a guide, a UK government guide that says, um, safety and technical requirements have not changed. So, um, what they what happened was that they took effectively took a snapshot of the standards, not only EMC standards, but all the standards for the, all the new approach directives, you know, single pressure vessels and toy safe and everything. They took a snapshot on 31st of December 2020 and said, right, okay, these are the UK designated standards. Same standard, different name. So just in time, um, the solar vote PV standard is um, safe and well and home and dry. Doesn't mean everybody is complying with it, <laughs> unfortunately. However, um, it looks like they will have to comply with it. Um, there was a little thing that was not clear in the 2020 version, which was whether it, whether it applied to optimizers. So people who made optimizers said, oh no, look, this doesn't apply. 
So the 2021 version clarifies that. Well, the 2021 version is not yet a harmonised European standard, and even when it becomes such, then it doesn't then become a UK designated standard automatically, although it might at some future date. Anyway, um, that's uh, the end. That's my email from Radcom. If you, there is a, the um, EMC help desk, which is uh, you, you can call with sort of routine issues, but uh, anything related to this presentation, that's how you can contact me. And have a look on the EMC committee website.